good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's installment of our Toward a More Perfect Union series. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the great pleasure of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship here at the United States Capitol Historical Society. And we're so grateful that you've taken time out of your busy day to spend a little bit with us and learn about critical forces and factors in our nation's history. So now it's also my great pleasure to introduce the president and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, uh, who's going to get us started. Jane? Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, Sam, for the work that you do to make these possible. Uh, we are so grateful that even in this busy holiday season, uh, some of our most dedicated listeners have joined in. Um, this is our More Perfect Union series that uh, will flow through uh, all the way until May. And we decided to do this as we looked at the issues that were going on in 2020. We determined that one of the real majesties of this country is that our founding fathers, and yes, they were all fathers, they were all white men, some of them owned people as property. But nevertheless, they set forth a set of documents that put a symbol of justice and equality out as a goal. And it has been the entire work of this country to try to reach that goal. So this series is our attempt to bring scholars together who have looked at how are we moving toward that more perfect union. Today's scholars, we are very fortunate to have with us, Dr. Daniel Lauritsen from Swarthmore uh, and Dr. Eleanor Powell from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Dr. Lauritsen um, is an assistant professor of sociology at Swarthmore College. He has a passionate interest in politics, inequality, and the way social position um, really shapes how people understand and relate to the social world, especially with regard to politics and inequality. His research focuses in three areas. First, in class inequality and the stratification thereof. His recent book, The Class Ceiling, Why It Pays to Be Privileged, uh, really identifies that and he's gonna share some of those learnings. He's also interested in the role of campaign professionals and political consultants in shaping American politics and is in the process of writing a book called The Room Where It Happens uh, that is coming out in 2022. And finally, he is involved with looking at political participation and engagement. What does it mean if people don't vote and who doesn't vote and why don't they vote? His background and training is from the University of California at Berkeley, where he earned his PhD and his postdoctorate work in sociology department at the London School of Economics well prepares him for the conversation ahead. His partner today is Dr. Eleanor Powell. Dr. Eleanor Powell is primarily a congressional scholar. Her research evolves around three themes the influence of money in American politics, understanding political parties, and exploring the complexity of congressional representation. She earned her PhD from Harvard University uh, before she came to the University of Wisconsin at Madison. She was an assistant professor at Yale University. And her book that is just about to come out where Money Matters in Congress examines the influence of money on the internal politics of Congress and the biases that it creates in the policymaking process. So you can see that we have distinguished scholars to look at the issue of how does class influence political participation? And we begin with Dr. Lauritsen. Hi, thank you so much for having me and thank you for that introduction. Um, so hi everybody, I've been introduced, I'm Daniel Lorison. Uh, I wanna to talk to you a bit about um, class inequality and political participation and how we ought to understand that. Um, so I will take you through briefly some of my own research um, 
that addresses that question. Um, and I'm happy to um, talk in the Q&A if you have questions uh, today and to be in touch further over, I put my Twitter handle there. If you're interested, um, I'm often uh, chatting with people there as well. So that's a great place to reach me and continue the conversation. All right. Um, so this uh, distribution should be fairly familiar to most of you if you follow politics, and I'm guessing if you're here that you do. Um, this is the results of the 2020 election. Um, we had the highest uh, overall turnout uh, in history in terms of numbers and in at least a century in terms of the rate of turnout. Um, but when we uh, talk about sort of what the results of the election were, we usually talk about it this way with the just thinking about sort of who voted for whom. Um, but what that leaves out is even with this highest uh, rate of turnout in a very, very long time, uh, close, uh, just about a third of people um, who were eligible, eligible to vote didn't vote. Um, this is the first time in an election that I've uh, looked at at least that the percentage of people who didn't vote was lower than the percentage for the winner, although only by just the smallest 0.1%. Uh, um, so uh, essentially a third of people voted for each of the two candidates and a third of people stayed home. Um, and that I think is an important fact about our democracy in the first place, we have a lower rate of turnout than um, many other major democracies and, um, uh, and that shapes how our democracy works. Uh, so um, we're here to talk about class inequality and political participation and what you might uh, be able to guess based on the title um, or maybe you already know this is that what that uh, what those people who don't look who don't vote look like is different um, from the people who do turn out to vote. Um, so here you can see uh, this is from the American National Election Survey. You can see the rate of voting by income percentile um, uh, since 1972. Um, really consistently, um, people in the highest income percentiles, uh, that's the, the top 4% is this light blue line here, uh, report voting at higher rates than uh, people earning less money, um, pretty consistently across time. Uh, that's true also if you just look at congressional voting, uh, the American National Election Survey data doesn't have midterm elections uh, after 1998, but uh, you can get the overall pattern again, uh, the people with the most vote the most. And what that means is that we get an electorate um, that is skewed, that is different than what the population looks like. Um, so here is just taking the average of uh, the income percentages across these, um, uh, across uh, congressional elections. Um, and you can see that the, um, you know, the, the population of the survey, um, roughly a third of people are in the top third of the income distribution. That makes sense. Um, that's that middle column, the yellow and the light blue. Um, Non-voters, or if actually if you look at voters, um, about 40% of, of people who vote are from that top third of the income distribution. Um, and uh, the bottom of the income distribution is about uh, twice as represented among non-voters as among voters. Um, so what that's saying, one way of uh, uh, you know, saying that a different way is that the electorate is disproportionately people who are well off. Um, that means that the electorate is also disproportionately white um, because of the intersection of class and uh, race and racism in this country. Um, so you can see um, here looking at the population in the middle versus voters and versus non-voters. Uh, voters, uh, this is presidential years just for some variety, voters are about uh, close to 70% white, um, non-voters are only about 60% white. Um, so there's a real um, disconnect between what the country as a whole looks like and what the voting population looks like. Um, Oh, and I showed you, uh, there's a whole book dedicated to that. There's a number of books dedicated to that. I showed you the um, one by Bernard Fraga called The Turnout Gap. Um, and there's three sort of primary schools of explanation for uh, why we see these big gaps, uh, these class gradients and these race gradients in political participation. Um, one is 
what I call the institutional explanation. Um, and that basically holds that, um, and there's, you know, there's a bunch of uh, research in this tradition. Uh, one of the classic ones is uh, by Francis Fox Piven and Richard Cloward. Um, a new one is uh, Carol Anderson's One Person No Vote, which you might have heard of recently. Um, but the basic argument here is that uh, we see low rates of voting and we see class skewed and race skewed voting um, because political parties and other institutional actors or elites are not interested in having uh, lower income, poor people, working class people vote, um, or they're overtly interested in suppressing uh, some votes often along racial lines. Um, and I think that's absolutely part of the story. We've seen lots of instances of attempts at voter suppression um, around the country in 2020 um, and for quite a while before that. Um, it's part of the story. But what you often see is when there's attempts at voter suppression, there's also a sort of corresponding pushback to get people out to vote despite those, um, despite those barriers. Um, and so I don't think that's the, the whole story. Another uh, big uh, common story that you hear about why poor and working class people are less likely to participate in politics is from a team of authors who publishes uh, one of these giant books. They're all about this fat um, every uh, five or seven years uh, about inequality and political participation. Um, and what their argument is essentially um, you know, they're mostly concerned with the facts of, of inequality, the ways that that uh, skews our democracy. Um, but when they try to explain it, they, they uh, in my view, do a bit of a circular logic. Why do people with less resources vote? Because they have less resources. Um, and uh, they sort of, when they talk about how to understand that class inequality in voting, they tend to see it as, um, something about the resources themselves. If you have less education, politics is more complicated and so, or seems more complicated to you, so you stay home. Or um, if you don't earn a lot, maybe there's, um, you know, you have less of the necessary um, skills because you're in a low skilled job, low skilled, um, and that keeps you from sort of being able to navigate the political process. Um, I don't think that's a very good explanation, although it's, it may very well be part of the story. Um, but there's a couple of problems with this resources lead to participation explanation. And I wanna talk about a couple of those problems and then show you a couple of, um, of uh, quotations from people I've talked to who are poor and working class themselves about sort of how they see politics. Um, so problem number one, this is the, um, it's not a very pretty chart, I apologize, I pulled it from someone else's report, but this is from um, the UK, and what you can see is that there hasn't always been a resource difference or a class difference in voting across time in the UK. So in 1987, there was essentially no difference in the rate at which people voted um, uh, by their income quintile. Um, that uh, increased over the last 30 years. Um, but there's, it, it sort of challenges the idea that there's a necessary relationship or there's an automatic relationship between, um, between class and political participation. Um, another one, and this is from my own work, a paper I'm finishing up right now uh, with a couple of co-authors, um, is that there's, uh, while there's a really steep class gradient in voting among white people in the United States, there's essentially no, um, or at least much, much less of a class gradient in voting among black people in the United States. Um, so this is showing uh, that, you know, white people from in the lowest income group um, are voting at about, uh, about 52 and a half, 52 percent of them are voting. Um, the poorest black people are actually voting at a substantial and significant, statistically significantly higher rate of, of about 57%. Um, so the, you know, the relationship between resources and voting is uh, not at all uh, linear here. Um, so um, while it's true that overall people with more resources vote more, that's not true in every racial ethnic group and it's not true in the same way in every racial ethnic group. Um, 
So what's going on? Um, here is a type of slide you don't see that often on a presentation about politics. Um, but what I want to, I'll just put myself in the middle of the art. Um, but what part of the story is uh, that for a lot of people um, who are upper middle class or middle class, uh, we look at politics the way that um, many of us also look at art museum art, which is it's a, uh, a pleasurable thing to discuss with other people. It's a hobby in some sense. There's a great book by Eaton Hirsch, um, which talks about the sort of hobbyism of political participation among uh, middle and upper middle class people. Um, so for most uh, upper middle class people, you know, when we look at either, uh, you know, the, the two images on the left uh, or the two images on the right, we could uh, say a lot of things about what their, um, what the differences are, how to interpret them, what they mean, etc. cetera. Um, some of us are not the kind of people who pay a lot of attention to football. Um, I'm certainly not. And so we might have a lot less to say about the important and meaningful differences between the two football images in the middle. Um, the, you know, the point of these sort of sets of images is to think about, you know, among people who are like you, um, can you talk about what is going on when you compare the top image to the bottom image in each one? Um, and for a lot of people, um, politics and fancy art are things that are reserved for other people. Um, you have, you know, many people have a sort of general sense that they're important, that they're meaningful, that they, you know, that some people really care about them, but who cares about them and how you're supposed to talk about them is, uh, is linked to class position and to other aspects of who we are. Um, so let me make that a little bit more concrete. Um, I interviewed uh, with a team of researchers uh, about a uh, hundred and some uh, poor and working class people in Philadelphia and uh, the rest of Pennsylvania. Um, and there were three sort of main themes that people talked about when they talked about how they think about what politics is, who it's for, um, whether they vote or, and uh, why they vote. Um, and one of those was, was about duty. It wasn't about, and I think a lot of people, when we think about um, politics, we think about it in terms of our interests. It's good for me or it's good for my values. If this party wins or if this other party wins, um, it will be good for my taxes or it will be good for supporting people I care about or et cetera. Um, and that was not absent when I talked to poor and working class people about their relationship to politics. Um, but the first, uh, but one of the first things a lot of people who did vote re regularly talked about was more about duty. And I think that this was especially common among black and uh, Hispanic or La Latina or, or Latino people, um, that there was a sense that um, politics was something that they had been excluded from up to uh, fairly recent memory. And it was therefore their obligation to participate um, whether or not they felt invited or included, um, uh, or whether or not they felt that they had sort of enough of a sense of what was going on. Um, so this is a quote from uh, one person we interviewed, Bernice. She said, my mother made sure I voted the first time, you know. Um, she told me, this is your civil duty. It's something you've got to do. We just do it and that's it. And that's what I told my kids. It's very important for them to vote because the things that we want to change, we can't change if nobody's voting. Um, so that was something we heard fairly often from people who were politically engaged. Um, but from people who were not politically engaged, uh, we often heard um, a sense that politics is something that other people do, just like um, fancy art museums might be something that other people do. Or for some of us who are a little bit geeky, football is something that other people do and that we don't pay much attention to. Um, so um, this is Selena, who is a pharmacy worker. Um, and she had just said uh, before we asked her this question that, you know, she doesn't really, uh, you know, she doesn't really care that much about politicians um, and they're not, they're not like her. And so we asked her, what backgrounds do you think they're from? And she says, and this is true, there's a great uh, work by a, a political scientist named Nick Carnes about the 
class backgrounds of politicians. She says, I can't really say, I will say a majority of them are from backgrounds that, you know, like they had a silver spoon in their mouth, you know, they were already, they, their parents already had plans for them. They had a, like already had accounts for them, money for them to set aside, you know, besides the people that didn't have money set aside. Um, so she's, you know, she has a real sense that politicians are people who come from wealth and privilege and are uh, different than, than she is and different than people she knows. Um, and similarly, um, we asked uh, 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 Joe, who's a white man with a high school diploma, um, to talk about how he, we asked this of everybody, but how do you picture someone who is more involved in politics than you are? And he says, I just imagine someone who wears a suit all the time. I'm trying to think very clean cut looking person. Um, I wouldn't imagine an average everyday sort of person being very involved. Um, and we said, so why are some people involved? And he said, I think it's just what interests them. If people are really interested in something, they follow it. Um, I can tell you about video games because that's what I like. Um, and that's uh, that kind of response that politics is just a hobby that some kinds of people have and not my kind of people um, is something we heard from a number of poor and working class people that we interviewed across all racial ethnic groups um, when they talked about uh, their relationship to politics. Um, so I will stop there. I'm happy to talk more about sort of what can be done or where this disconnect might come from in a bit more detail in the in the Q and A. Um, but I uh, appreciate you listening to me and look forward to talking with you uh, when we get to the Q and A. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Lordson. So interesting, and certainly sets up the conversation for Dr. Powell to talk about how money influences politics, particularly Congress. So, Dr. Powell, take it away. So, what I'm here to talk about is sort of again, these issues of class and particip political participation, but with more of a focus on campaign contributions instead of a focus on voting. Uh, so these uh, two, I think, are going to really fit together uh, together well. So I'm going to try to cover three things in my sort of brief time with you all today. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tremendous evolution we've seen in the financing of congressional campaigns over the arc of American history. And this is just something where we've seen tremendous change, and I'll sort of go through some of the three periods that, that we see with regard to financing of congressional campaigns. Then I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about who actually contributes to congressional campaigns. And this is where we, I think you know, resources may not play a big role in uh, political participation when it comes to voting, but when you're talking about campaign contributions, resources are sort of central to some of the, the activity that we see. And then finally, I'll try to conclude by talking a little bit about sort of how do these campaign contributions matter for actually what happens in Congress? So how does the money translate to sort of congressional activity and potentially into the policy outcomes that, that we see at the end? But to sort of begin, we'll talk about the evolution of the financing of congressional campaigns. And we've seen big changes in the uh, regimes of campaign finance. So first we see big changes in campaign finance laws. We go from the founding of our country where we have basically no laws with regard to campaign finance. It's sort of the wild west, anything goes period initially. And eventually we see some regulations and changes over time, although some of the uh, rules that are put in place are struck down by the Supreme Court, and new rules get put in place. So we see a little bit of an ebb and flow with regard to the rules. The other big thing that's shaping this evolution is the change in campaign environment. So of course, during this period of American history, we've seen a tremendous expansion of the franchise from you know, initially you know, only land owning white men <laughs> could vote. And you know, again, we see that it's the gradual expansion in sort of who can vote, who can participate. We also see, of course, the introduction of party primaries, and we see tremendous technological change. I mean, we're you know conducting this seminar via Zoom, something of course our founding fathers could never even imagine, let alone when we think about how campaigns were conducted during these earlier periods. So I'll try to talk about these sort of three periods, the sort of anything goes era from about our founding to around 1980s-ish, to this period when we had sort of a stronger set of disclosure rules and limitations on campaign finance participation from about 1980 to 2010. And then I'll talk about our sort of more recent history, the last decade, which I sort of call the post-disclosure era, which again, we've seen some limitations and disclosure rules um, struck down by the courts. And we found a variety of loopholes where people have uh, found ways to circumvent the rules and limitations that, that we do have. 
But we'll start about talking about this sort of anything goes early period from 1789 to 1980. And I should note that we know relatively little about congressional fundraising during this period. And you know, what we do know is due to historians, archivists, and the sort of luck of surviving documents, you know, all of which have done sort of tremendous work to tell us what happened then. Because again, of course, there were no campaign finance rules. It's not like the modern period where you know, people had to submit their fundraising reports every quarter, and then you'd have this beautiful website that would just tell us some amount about what's going on. Again, instead, there were no rules. There were no rules regarding um, to um, limiting what could be done in terms of campaign contributions and sort of tracking what was done. So during this period, we had a lot of wealthy candidates self-funding their campaigns. And we did have periods of sort of out and out bribery during this, this time as well, where we weren't just seeing contributions to campaigns, but we were seeing, you know, money that was given in ex and politicians were just pocketing in exchange for various political acts. We, of course, had a long period of, um, we call them tick kickbacks or party taxes that from patronage position beneficiaries. So, you know, people who would receive these patronage positions would then be expected to give money back to the party that would then fund uh, congressional campaigns and other sorts of political campaigns. There were, of course, no limits on mega donors or the sort of influence of the wealthy in terms of what people could spend on campaigns and in many other ways during this period. Although I would note that generally the sort of scope and scale of spending is much lower than what we see today. So there weren't any rules and there were certainly lots of large contributions happening, but it's not the, the scope and scale of money that we see in, in politics today. So I don't have time to go too much into some of the um, you know, amazing historical examples that we have from this period, but I thought I would just share one uh, example of a wealthy candidate self-funding during this time. So uh, George Washington, of course, one of our founding fathers, in his 1757 campaign for the Virginia House of Burgesses, right, the uh, Virginia State House, he had a district where there were 391 voters, and to help uh, persuade those voters to vote for him. Washington purchased 28 gallons of rum, 50 gallons of rum punch, 34 gallons of wine, 46 gallons of beer, and two gallons of cider royale. A lot of, a lot of booze was purchased but just to help to persuade voters. So again, maybe not the scope and scale of the TV commercials that we see in, your, for, in today's modern campaigns, but sort of a non-trivial amount of money or at least booze was, was purchased to help uh, persuade voter, voters in Washington's early campaigns. All right, so moving on from this sort of Wild West era, and I should note that you know, during this sort of early anything goes period, there were various rules that were eventually put into place limiting bribery, limiting other types of campaign activity, although some of them were sort of struck down by the courts and didn't last very long. The big change that we see is following the Watergate scandal, we see a real tightening of campaign finance rules. In 1970, 1974, we see the passage of the Federal Election Campaign Act that puts into place serious limits on campaign contributions to both individual candidates and the total amount of money that a donor could give to all political or at least all federal campaigns. This created a relatively stricter disclosure regime with many fewer loopholes. So again, there were sort of relatively low limits on campaign giving and these donations, at least over $200, all needed to be disclosed at people, both journalists, uh, voters, academics and others could then look up and see what giving uh, happened and sort of try to trace these donor relationships. That brings us, however, to our more recent period, what I call the post-disclosure era from about 2010-ish to the present. We saw a series of Supreme Court cases that struck down or really weakened the disclosure regime and various contribution limits. And donors found with the help of various campaign finance lawyers, very creative loopholes for mega donors and others to contribute extremely large sums of money. And this, Dark money happens, you know, through super PACs. It happens through um, nonprofit groups. There's sort of various different paths that, you know, I could happy to talk about in the Q and A that create sort of dark money paths that are really difficult to track. So we've see, really seen an elimination both of the, the relatively low contribution limits, and we've also seen a, a sort of limitation of the disclosure, where it's very difficult to see how much money is being given to whom, and at least it's hard to do so in a very timely. Uh, system, a timely manner. All right, so 
those are the sort of three periods of um, funding of congressional campaigns. It's worth thinking a little bit about who's actually giving to these congressional campaigns. And compared to other forms of political activity, particularly with comparing to voting activity, very few people contribute to political campaigns and even fewer give large campaign contributions. Uh, so this graph here is from um, Schlossman, Brady, and Verba, um, Unequal and Unrepresented Political Inequality and the People's Voice in the New Gilded Age, a Princeton, 2018 Princeton University Press book. Um, and they sort of are documenting sort of different types of participation in different political activities. And we see voting, it's not the highest of levels, but you see voting is the, the most frequent activity here. And we see very few people are engaging in campaign work. And then when we get to campaign contributions, they say about 12% of people self-report contributing to political campaigns. And it's worth noting that's all political campaigns. That's not just congressional, that's presidential, state, local, et cetera. So again, this is not a widespread activity by the American uh, public. And so today really only a very small number of people are donating to political candidates. We look at sort of, um, even in 2020, this very active fundraising year with a sort of record setting levels of participation, record setting levels of fundraising, only about 1.3% of the US population gave at least $200 to a federal candidate PAC or outside group. And that's from the Center for Responsive Politics. So this is you know, not a common activity. This is a pretty unusual activity for people to give at least $200. And even if you're talking about smaller levels, I mean, you're talking about 10 or 12% of the public giving money. So this is not a widespread uh, activity. And it's worth noting that donors are different and they're different in a number of ways, but one of the most notable ways, again, this sounds sort of obvious is that they're wealthier, especially the large donors. And, you know, this is talking about not just giving your time or expressing your, your position. This is, you know, actually about giving money. So if you don't have the money to give, it's very difficult to give large contributions, uh, let alone small contributions. And it's worth noting that the wealthy have different political views than the regular public. And that's particularly true of the uber wealthy. This is something that's difficult to measure in some ways because, you know, the sort of uber wealthy sort of mega donor type people don't often participate in surveys. And they certainly don't usually get enough of them to be able to say anything representative. But there's an interesting article um, by Paige Bartels and Seawright where they did essentially a survey of the sort of uber wealthy, the uber uh, elite. And they asked them about a bunch of their policy positions. And they compared those policy positions that the sort of uber wealthy had to the general public. And they see really big differences across a number of areas. You know, one of the areas here that you know I'm showing you in, in the chart is essentially it has to do with um, you know, federal spending and sort of jobs programs, you know, the you know, first item on this chart, the government must see that no one is without food, clothing, or shelter. Only about 43% of the wealthy are in favor of that, whereas 68% of the general public is in favor of that. You know, moving down the, the list, you know, the government should provide a decent standard of living for the unemployed. Only 23% of the wealthy favor that, 50% of the general public. And so one can sort of go through along the list across a bunch of different policy areas. This is true of the economy, of the environment, of the economy. There are just different policy preferences that these sort of uber wealthy donors tend to have relative to the sort of uh, regular folks who you know aren't able to, to contribute large amounts of money to campaigns. It's worth noting, you know, while I say that you know, most donors, um, you know, Donors tend generally to be wealthier and particularly mega donors are obviously wealthier and different in a number of ways. It is worth noting sort of one um, uh, sort of leveling of the playing field is sort of the internet has created an opportunity for sort of the power of for candidates, political candidates and politicians to really harness the power of small donors. So in 2020, small donors made up about 22% of all contributions. And when taken collectively, you're talking about real money, right? So small donors gave about $2.8 billion in 2020. And they did this really through texting campaigns, email campaigns. If you've ever had the misfortune to get your name on a list of any politician, you know, you'll be bombarded with emails, you know, every couple of days, you know, or texts every couple of days or multiple times a day, you know, begging for money, explaining the latest crisis and why you need to give to their campaign. And it's worth noting that certain candidates are better able to appeal to small donors than to sort of other types than, than mega donors. And so you know, there's, this creates a sort of path for candidates or for politicians or people with views that don't may not be appealing to the mega rich, 
to sort of have a sort of alternate power base of donors. So we, we saw during the primary, you know, Bernie Sanders was especially able to and successful to appeal to these sorts of donors. We also see President Trump, you know, a lot of his fundraising came from these small donors and these sort of small contribution levels. So again, sort of generally we think of, you know, campaign contributions as maybe not the, the level of playing field, but there are ways in which the internet and technology you're creating sort of alternate paths for candidates to sort of ha uh, harness power from different types of donors who may not have traditionally given in, in past campaigns. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about just how campaign contributions matter in Congress. You know, often when we think about the influence of money in Congress, we think about this sort of like cliched way where you know, someone gives a campaign contribution and that changes how someone vote, how members of Congress vote in Congress. Right, changes the roll call vote, the sort of quid pro quo model of exchange. And that's really not how it works. And there's a fair bit of research to back this up. It's not that it never happens. It's not that we never see campaign contributions sort of buying votes, but it seems pretty rare and isolated. And that's for a number of reasons, in part because it would be you know, illegal if you could actually document that sort of form of, of bribery. But instead, we see money translating to sort of more subtle forms of influence in Congress. So, you know, it, money giving a politician campaign contributions or sort of changes that your access relationship it helps you get a meeting with influential legislators, it sort of gives you an opportunity to state your case to sort of explain why a problem is important to explain why they should do something for you. And that face time, you know, really has the potential to make a big difference. It also helps to shift which legislators hold positions of power. And so in the modern Congress, this is something I, you know, I talk about in my forthcoming book, you know, members of Congress really have to fundraise a lot of money for the for their party, for other members of Congress in order to get leadership positions in Congress, in order to sort of build coalitions to get things done. And so members who are good and powerful funders, who are powerful, successful fundraisers, you have an opportunity to really shape a lot of what happens in the chamber. And that again, different, you know, benefits certain types of legislators who are better at the sort of fundraising game. Okay, so just to sort of conclude here, uh, what sort of uh, recap a little bit when we think about sort of campaign contributions and inequality. Again, we just think about the sort of tremendous evolution in the financing of congressional campaigns over the arc of American history from the sort of anything goes founding era where we saw, you know, out and out bribery in cases where we saw, you know, political kickbacks and, and others. Then we sort of moved into sort of a more tightened disclosure era from about 1980 to 2010. And sort of more recently, we've moved into the sort of post-disclosure era where we still have you know, campaign finance rules in the books, but they've been sort of weakened and people have found loopholes to exploit in various ways such that, you know, large donors can really give large amounts of money. And we think about sort of who's contributing to the, these congressional campaigns, you know, for the most part, we're talking about wealthy donors, particularly when we're thinking about large contributions. Although there is the sort of increasingly the, you know, power of the internet and technology to help sort of harness the sort of aggregate power of small dollar uh, campaign contributions, which can add up to sort of serious amounts of money for campaigns. And finally, when we think about sort of how campaign contributions matter in Congress, they can really influence, you know, who's able to get face time with members of Congress, who's able to sort of make their case to get things done, who holds positions of power in Congress, and who can get things done. So again, there's sort of lots of different ways this can shape the policy making process and sort of eventually shape uh, policy outcomes as well. So thank you, and I'll look forward to our, our discussion. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Powell, Dr. Lardson. It is certainly given us a lot to, to think about, and this is a moment for our listeners where you have an opportunity to participate by sending your questions in through the Q&A, and I will try to pull those into the conversation. But before we get into that, a uh, couple, couple things. Um, both of you talked about the, what it means to participate in politics, either in voting or in contributing. And we saw in 2020 that there were new ways to participate. There's early voting, there was mail-in voting, um, the role of social media in the engagement, whether it's Twitter or Instagram, you know, Facebook, whatever, uh, your favorite social media, that somehow that was related to the small donor. And so I'd like you to comment on how those changes, you know, if someone, it would seem to me 
that if someone made a small contribution, even if they made a small contribution, they would be likely to be alerted, they would be more likely to vote and to talk about it amongst their friends. And that having that opportunity to participate at a smaller level may be a component of expanding the electorate. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? You can take turns. I want to hear from both of you about this. I could talk about the um, the sort of ways that people can participate, and I'll, I'll focus on the voting and then um, shift to focusing on the donations, maybe. But um, uh, you know, there's so we don't have evidence yet from 2020 about, um, or at least not very good evidence that I would rely on about uh, the class composition of the electorate. There's, there's the exit polls, but they're I'm skeptical. Um, they're not a great way to look at that. Um, and the surveys that that uh, analyze voting um, haven't released their data yet. So um, I don't know. I don't know for sure. Um, it's clear more people voted. Um, but I, you know, studies that have looked at ways that people that uh, states or localities have made voting easier have generally found so, you know, or vote my, by mail in Oregon, for example, or things like the motor voter law or those sorts of things have generally found while they increase the overall level of voting, they actually also increase the inequality in voting. So what happens is that people who were generally inclined to vote in the first place vote even more and people who were probably not going to vote poor and working class people vote a little bit more. Um, so everybody's voting goes up, but rich people's voting goes up more. Um, so um, that would be my guess if I had to guess about the what the um, 2020 election looks looked like, at least in terms of the effects of uh, things like vote by mail and early voting. On the other hand, there was a lot of um, real efforts to reach out to new and infrequent voters um, than um, uh, in, in local organizations, in statewide organizations uh, that hadn't happened before. Uh, one of the other sort of causes of class inequality in political participation is that campaigns tend to only focus on people who uh, have voted before or are semi-regular voters. There's a class gradient in that. And so you get sort of a vicious cycle where the campaigns don't talk to the people who never vote. People who never hear from a campaign or a candidate are less likely to vote, et cetera. Um, so those, those might be countervailing forces because I think a lot of uh, new organizations that have sprung up in the last three, four, five years um, have done outreach to people who don't vote very often. So that might have made there be uh, less inequality in voting. Dr. Powell. Yeah, in terms of um, campaign contributions and the sort of social media dynamic in 2012 we, or 2020, we've really seen some, some interesting things where, you know, the Social media and the, the internet have made campaigns or helped campaigns be really nimble in responding to these things. So, you know, if something happens in the news, a candidate says something outrageous, and then they can immediately translate that into asking for campaign contributions in support of their candidacy to protect the world from something the other candidate's doing, vice versa. And we've seen sort of both campaign or you know, both parties, politicians across the ideological spectrum really rely on some of these techniques. You know, this is not necessarily new to 2020. We've seen this in the last couple of years. You know, we saw it, you know, famously, um, you know, Joe Wilson, you know, interrupted President Obama's State of the Union address by saying, you lie. And that became known as a sort of a, a money bomb event where essentially something really noteworthy and um, happened to a, an obscure member of Congress. And then immediately that member of Congress was able to raise really large money amounts of money in the sort of hours following that event. And that sort of creates these incentives for particularly more obscure politicians to sort of harness the sort of outrage machine where, you know, you say something out outlandish, you get the media attention and that immediately translates into large amounts of money. And so it's not necessarily, I guess, about larger engagement, but it is sort of bringing maybe smaller donors in who were mobilized by some event that they found outrageous or particularly compelling to sort of bring them in to the system, whereas maybe they wouldn't in the old days have ever received a request to give money to a, to a member of Congress or to sort of um, participate in the system that way. For, for both of you, question is, there's been a move toward public financing of campaigns. Um, 
has that made a difference in terms of voter participation or has it made a difference in terms of the role of money in, in politics? So Dr. Lawrence and Dr. Powell, can you each comment on your area of expertise? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I was going to try to get you to go first, but um, I mean, I think the I would actually say, just say one other thing about this, you know, the question you asked before, which is that you know the the percentage of people who give is so much smaller than the percentage of people who vote that that I think the and the networks of people who are doing either or both are really generally don't overlap that much. So part of what's going on is that you know people participate in politics in various ways because the people around them are saying, hey, did you hear Joe Wilson said this thing, you can give him some money or, um, you know, or did you hear Bernie's running for, you know, Bernie's the candidate, we got to get behind him or, you know, we got to defeat Trump or we got to support Trump or whatever it is. Um, and to the extent that those, you know, if you don't have anybody saying that in your sort of social milieu, the chance that you're going to do any of those things is very low. Um, and so, um, all the things that um, make it a little bit easier increase the chance that there's someone in a given person's social world who's doing one of those things. Um, but it's not usually, you know, giving money first and then voting. Um, the people who are, giving, who are giving money are almost always going to be people who are voting already. Um, but I, yeah, but I'll let uh, my colleague talk about uh, the public. Dr. Powell. Yeah, so that's a great question about sort of, um, you know, all the different local initiatives that are sort of experimenting with um, campaign finance reform and sort of what impact that's having. You know, I think, you know, we've just seen those efforts at a, at a pretty small local scale, and they do seem to sort of have an effect, you know, when you can change the local rules, it, it limits the large contributions, it potentially empowers uh, smaller donors. I think the difficulty that we're seeing is trying to understand how those efforts would translate to um, congressional elections or sort of national politics more broadly. You know, the Supreme Court has taken a pretty strong stance in terms of interpreting money as speech, and they've been pretty aggressive in striking down most efforts to really limit you know, the amount of contributions, the amount of political activity uh, people can engage with. And so, especially with the sort of increasing tilt of the Supreme Court, it's really hard to imagine that any of those local level initiatives, which may be effective at the local level, you know, being upheld if they were enacted at, at the federal level. And so you, you'd have a difficult time getting them through Congress in the first place. But I think trying to understand sort of which of those initiatives, you know, could withstand Supreme Court scrutiny to then um, potentially have an effect at, at the national level, it's, it's difficult to see a path there. Now, let's talk a little bit about what do we learn from the most two most recent presidential elections. In 2016, the person who spent the most money didn't win. And in 2020, the person who had won in 2016 but hadn't spent the most money got more votes than he got in 2016 and lost. So what does that say about where we're going in terms of voter engagement, uh, money in politics? Is there, are there, are there lessons to be learned? So Dr. Powell, you get to go first because Dr. Lordson was like, okay, it's her turn. So it's, it's a great question. And this is an area where, you know, it's pretty clear that, and this has sort of been true for in American politics for a long time, money isn't everything. Money, having the most money is not gonna guarantee you an election victory. It's true that most of the time the candidate with more money tends to win that election, but that's not necessarily because they had more money. That's often because more compelling candidates often draw in more money from donors, right? It's sort of the money goes in the other direction. And political scientists have had a really difficult time actually isolating the effect of money on campaign outcomes because it's so hard to measure. And in part, it's difficult to measure because the politicians would never say like, well, I won't, you know, you can't do an experiment where essentially a politician says, I won't spend any money because they all are convinced it's the end all and be all for a successful campaign. They would never agree to run a race without any money. And so this is a really difficult uh, problem to measure. You know, it looks like money has a sort of small effect, but you know, it depends on how you spend it. It depends on the context of how much money the other candidate has. It's not necessarily that, 
more money is going to always translate into a better outcome. But essentially, money gives candidates the resources to make their case, to, to reach different voters, to try to get out the vote, to try to do different things. But they have to spend it wisely. And there's, it's very possible there's some threshold effects where, you know, money after a certain point, there's sort of diminishing returns to the extra $50 million of how much money one can spend effectively, particularly for money that comes in at the last minute. You know, I think we saw this time around that, you know, some of the uh, congressional candidates and Senate candidates were getting so much money at the last minute, they literally couldn't find ways to spend it. It ended up with sort of extra money that was unspent, not because they didn't want to, but just there's only so much money you can efficiently spend in a small period of time. And so it's not everything but I think any political candidate or staffer or anyone who's worked on a campaign would tell you it helps, it doesn't hurt, but it's, it's not the end all and be all that there's a lot more that goes into a successful campaign and you know, the preferences of the electorate it, it do matter. It just helps you reach those voters who might ordinarily be tough to turn out. And you know, a lot of the money is spent on get out the votes of sort of friendly supportive voters rather than persuading skeptical voters too. Dr. Lauritsen. Can you um, comment so, on this and give absolutely. us a perspective? Is Twitter more important than than dollars? I don't. I mean, Twitter. I mean, I think one thing that gets missed sometimes in talking about how campaigns work is that there's most people vote for an R or a D. If they vote at all, they vote for the same letter, regardless of who the camp candidate is, regardless of what the campaign does. Um, regardless of pretty much anything that we all who pay a lot more attention to politics follow across the news. So there's always these like, you know, high profile moments um, in campaigns that get sort of attributed to, you know, uh, you know, Romney was caught saying 47% of people don't pay taxes and that's why he lost or, you know, et cetera. And usually when, when political scientists and others go to analyze that, it doesn't actually affect hardly anything about what people do when they get to the voting booth. Um, so that, you know, the sort of broader point is it's actually, it's really hard to parse um, what, you know, what any given campaign action of, has, oh, I've lost my syntax, what effect any given campaign action has on an election outcome. Because most, it's like, it's hard to get people to do stuff um, is sort of the fundamental insight of the studies of campaigns and elections. Like campaigns try really hard political professionals who I talk to are like, yeah, actually, it's really hard to know what we're, what effect the stuff we're doing has. Um, so I think that's a really important um, sort of context for asking any of these questions about how money affects outcomes. Um, is Twitter more important than dollars? I mean, the, the short answer is the people who are on Twitter are almost all deeply politically engaged and following politics at least are almost all deeply politically engaged in the first place. So the chance that you're gonna move somebody by Twitter is very low. Um, uh, yeah, so so that's, I could say more about all of that, but, but uh, I'll stop there. Well, I tell you, this is a, a fascinating conversation and we are coming to the end of our time. Uh, someone asked the uh, ever important question is, <clears throat> will there be a recording? The answer is yes, uh, we will. We are recording this. It will be on our website within the next couple of days. All the registrants will get a notice when it is up and, you know, please share it because it has been a fascinating conversation. So our, our last question as we move out, this is sort of your opportunity to say what you want to say to leave us with is, do get out the vote activities work? Dr. Powell, you get to go first. So I would give, I would give a, a qualified answer to this, which is I would say that there are some that work. They're message, you know, sending people postcards, knocking on doors, you know, showing up, you know, talking to people directly, having conversations. Those things do work, but you're talking about working at a very low level. So you're talking about you know, you know, getting a very small increase in political participation out of the, a lot of work. So it's it's not that you know, and there are ones that work better than others, but the ones that do work work at you know again you're talking about influencing a relatively small number of people who you can sort of push to show up on election day or potentially uh, change their vote which is even harder than getting someone to show up on election day so 
you know, knocking on doors, sending postcards, text messages, phone messages, you, you can sort of try to measure them relative to each other, but you're talking about all of them are working at small levels and, you know, maybe they sort of aggregate together and different types of voters are best reached in different types of ways. So it often talk, talk, depends on which type of voters you're trying to reach with which technology. And so, you know, you wanna think about who you're trying to reach when you think about which uh, get out the vote uh, efforts you wanna to try to pursue. Um, Actually, Lawrence, do you have last words? Yeah, I, I would just add to that that a lot of that kind of effort feels to everybody who receives it, but I think especially to poor and working class people and communities, like every four years, the campaigns come and they try to get me to do this thing and then I don't hear from them for four years. So I think one of the solutions to increasing political participation among uh, poor and working class communities is more sustained involvement from political parties, from political organizations, from other kinds of community organizations trying to connect people to politics. Um, I think the, you know, the, the sort of one hit or two hits every four years moves some people, but the reason it moves very few people is because it feels instrumental and it is instrumental. Um, and so to have a more equal democratic polity, I think we need more um, long-term investment in the, the ways that people be, can be connected to elected officials and to politics more broadly. Well, that is great advice, Dr. Lawrenson. And in many ways, that is what we do at the United States Capitol Historical Society is try to continue to connect people to the work done in the Capitol, the work of the Congress and how it has an impact on people's real daily lives. And we thank both of you for contributing your time to this effort. The Historical Society, I know this sounds a little bit like public TV, but we only are able to do what we do because of the support of the members and donors for the society. So as you look at your end of the year plans, if you can find it in your, in your heart and in your pocketbook to make a contribution to the Historical Society, we would be most grateful. Mm -hmm.